We leave this recorded portion of today's Washington Journal to take you live back to Capitol Hill and the House Energy and Commerce Committee as they continue a markup of an energy and climate change bill. Live coverage. Work, work, work. Uh, Mr. Barton, you have, um, you have some amendments on your side, and let's Mr. Chairman, uh, we have, bring them up. We have two. Or did we? Did we come? We dispose of the pending amendments. Yes. Did we? Did we? Yes, it was withdrawn. Oh yes. That's correct. Right. Okay. Okay, Mr. Radonovich is going to offer an in block amendment, which would be Radonovich 09, Deal 005, Upton 20, Shattuck 1, Shattuck 501B, and Walden Hydro 5. I think. Okay. Him, yeah, let's give the clerks a chance to find these so that we can have them distributed and have the right ones distributed. It's uh, Mr. S oh. Chairman. Just, just wait a minute. Radonovich 9 and okay. DL5. Radonovich 9. Please. And DL5. And DL5, and what else? That's it. Up, Upton 20, Shattuck Up, 1. Upton 20, Shattuck 1. Shattuck. 501B. It's this list. It's this list. Shattuck, so Shattuck's got two amendments in there, 501B. And Waldron Hydro 5. Serve a point of order. The gentlelady reserves a point of order. And make, sh make sure that uh, Booyer knows that he's off and all of this. On the first one, yes. Okay. On this one. Well, we're doing this one now. Radonovich. Yeah, Radonovich. Okay, you started with the second. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. You're in the next one. It's all right. We just divide it into two. So. Okay, Okay. I'm just doing what you told me. I know. You are. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't make enough copies of that. So. We didn't make enough copies? You use it. Clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> An amendment offered by Mr. Radonovich at the end of Title III. Insert the following new amendment will be considered as read.
chair will withdraw her reservation and recognize Mr. Radonovich for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairwoman, uh, my amendment is the agriculture jobs off-ramp amendment, and I happen to represent the great Central Valley in California. We pr produce and grow some of the best fruits and vegetables, not just for California, but for the entire country, and, uh, and it's got a large export component of it as well and um, right now we're suffering mightily not because of the global warming bill but because the Endangered Species Act which protects a worthless little worm that uh, uh, is going extinct and it's shut down the pumps and it's costing the people of Central Valley 40,000 jobs this year and a loss of two billion dollars of income in the state's largest industry. Now as I'd mentioned this is not due to global warming. It's due to the abuses of a well-intentioned law that was written in 1974, the Endangered Each Species Act that's run amok and creating uh, an enormous amount of job losses. My concern is that this type of environmental alarmism is going to be the result of this global warming bill and its adverse impacts on the price of agricultural input costs, not just in California, but all across the country. My fear is that this bill will increase the price of gas or diesel, natural gas, electricity, fertilizer, cars, trucks, tractors, and trailers, transportation in the form of rail, truck, and plane, machine parts, and traditional agriculture tools. This bill, I believe, will disproportionately punish low and middle class families in my district, many of whom are traditionally agriculture workers. And if these agriculture jobs are lost, we will mostly be more dependent on foreign, food, for, uh, on foreign sources for our, for our food supply. If you like buying oil from Hugo Chavez, you're going to love buying your breakfast, lunch, and dinner from him as well because these types of increased costs on California agriculture and American agriculture will force these industries offshore and in, in, in different countries. And that's why I'm dropping this legislation, this amendment that would require the Secretary of Labor to report back on the number of agriculture jobs lost nationally. And if it reaches 5%, the provisions of this act will cease to be effective. Uh, I want to thank you for the consideration of this bill and uh, yield to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattig. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, uh, I appreciate his proportion of this on block amendment. I have two pieces in it. Uh, one deals with the issue of essentially the foreign aid provision in this legislation. This legislation calls for spending money by giving it to other countries to purchase clean technology from the United States. Uh, unfortunately, it talks about the expenditure of billions of dollars, uh, minimum of $6.374 billion in the time period from 2012 to 2021, another $7.977 billion from 2022 to 2026, another $81 billion in the period 2027 to 2050, for a total minimum of over $95 billion, which we give away to foreign countries to buy clean technology. As worthy as that goal may be, uh, there are many here in this country who think that money would be better spent in the United States. Uh, my amendment simply says it should go instead to low-income consumers uh, here in the United States. The second uh, amendment which I have recognizes the legitimate stake that states have in this issue, and that is uh, we have uh, concern on our side of the aisle about employment. We've offered many different avenues to try to address increasing unemployment uh, in this legislation or as a result of this legislation. All of those amendments have been uh, rejected. This is yet another attempt. This is an attempt that would say that if, as a result of this legislation, unemployment goes up in a given state by more than 2 percent, then that state may opt out of Title III by one of three things, a declaration by its governor, a piece of legislation by its legislature uh, opting out, or a vote of its people. Uh, this is a recognition that it is the people who will be impacted. They have local officials who re represent them, and that some portions of the country are being adversely affected at the moment, much worse than others. For example, my friends from Michigan, uh, which face the highest unemployment in the nation. Uh, and I would strongly urge the adoption of these two amendments and yield back my time to Mr. Rodonovic. Will the gentleman yield? Mr. I'd be happy to yield. I just want to say I was glad to have my amendment included as part of this as well. As Mr. Shattuck said, 
There is no bigger issue in the Midwest, let alone Michigan, than the jobs issue. And yesterday, our unemployment numbers came out, and they're almost 13 percent. And we're well on the way to the dire prediction of perhaps 20 percent by the end of the summer. And what my amendment does is this. I, I know that we saved Mr. Wilder's job, who did a terrific job as a, one of the reading clerks there for a minute or two, going through 40 or 50 pages, as I understand it. But as we look at this bill itself, we're going we're to see a lot of jobs go someplace else, a lot more than just Mr. Wilder's. And what my amendment says is that if there is a greater than a 10 percent unemployment rate across the country, that we would cease the transfer of money to foreign entities and instead divert it to worker training for people who lost their jobs in this country. It's a good amendment. It's part of this one, uh, the on block, and I'd like to think that it would be considered. I yield back to the gentleman from California. The gentleman's time's expired. I thank the gentleman and yield back the time I don't have. Uh, for the gentleman from Massachusetts. I thank the gentlelady very much. We've had this discussion uh, over and over again, and it has manifested itself in uh, different ways, but it all comes down to the same decision which we have to make. Uh, and that is whether or not uh, we believe that the legislation which we are considering uh, is going to create a new generation of green jobs. Uh, whether or not it is going to lead to developing the domestic capacity for us to begin to back out that 13 million barrels of oil a day which we consume uh, from overseas. That is the choice. This particular iteration, this particular formulation is one that gives to the EPA administrator the ability to make a determination regarding job losses. In this case, uh, the cessation of the operation of the legislation is tied to job losses in the agriculture industry. We fundamentally reject uh, on our side of the aisle uh, this level of pessimism with regard to the opportunities which this legislation is going to present, especially in the agricultural sector, especially in the offsets. Uh, sections of the uh, legislation, uh, uh, especially with regard to the, the solar and to um, the wind which is going to be possible out in the rural parts of this country. Uh, we fundamentally reject it. And to tie the long-term implementation of this legislation uh, to a determination by the uh, administrator of the EPA would be to fundamentally destroy the confidence which the investors not only of our country but the world would have in this program. Uh, we are trying to create some confidence, some long-term predictability uh, that will lead us to a new generations of jobs, not just in urban America, but here empowering rural America. They have a huge role in the, uh, uh, in the effort that this legislation is going to unleash. And so we have already cast this vote at least a half a dozen times. Uh, there have been uh, a different uh, number of approaches which have been taken to derail this bill, to create off-ramps which end uh, the ability for this uh, legislation to be implemented. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, uh, the vote must be no. There is a, there's a new dawn uh, of uh, energy uh, job creation which this bill will signal. Uh, by the end of this evening, uh, and I urge the members not to allow a decision made by an EPA administrator uh, to end it, because that will be the top line of every memo written in every investment banking firm in the world about whether or not they should be investing in the new technologies that we are trying to unleash. Would the gentleman yield for a question? I mean, let, me, let me yield first to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sabanks. Thank you uh, for yielding. Um, very quickly. There has been a lot of discussion of these off-ramps. And conceptually, what I have arrived at is that we are on this highway and every proposal that the, that the other side has put forward is designed to, to take an off-ramp from the future. We are never going to get to where we need to get if we keep putting our blinker on and taking the next off-ramp. And meanwhile, as we are going as we are getting off the highway, 
these other countries are continuing on and passing us by. And that's the danger here. So whether it's a small off-ramp or the giant off-ramp in the form of the substitute that was offered a little while ago, we can't afford to stop this forward progress. And I would urge people to reject this proposal. Will the gentleman yield? I, I, I will reclaim my time. The, um, the Shattuck and the Upton amendments also shift the emission allowances away from the International Clean Technology Deployment uh, Program. Uh, and, uh, and, and there, too, we are trying to create uh, partnerships so that we can have a, a global approach to uh, these issues. Uh, I don't think that uh, this approach makes any sense whatsoever, but I will be glad to yield to whoever it is that is seeking just uh, recognition. Have the a gentleman a from uh, Michigan, Mr. Upton. Just a, a quick comment. Our, my, my amendment is not an off ramp. It is actually it is a diversion of the money back to worker tra training. But I just would like to know if the gentleman knows how much money is in this bill for the uh, international fund and how much money is in there for worker training for those that uh, are displaced because of the act. And like Mr. Shimkus, I know the answer, <laughs> I think. And I'll, I'll let the for the international programs. How many? I'll put it this yes. way: Do you know how many times greater the international fund is over the d displaced worker fund? Uh, One, two, three, four, or five? No, the the international worker. The, I'm sorry. The the workers program is essentially one half of one percent of the um, of the allocation, and the uh, international program I think is approximately one percent of the. Uh, including including adaptation um, uh, to the program. Gentlemen's time's expired. The vote now occurs. No, no, ma answer was Madam Chairwoman, four. I would seek recognition and support. Also, we all, we agreed Does to. The gentleman minutes. ask unanimous consent to be recognized. Two if minutes. I need unanimous consent, I I didn't know I needed it. But we agreed to. Five, ten minutes on each side. Oh, okay, the gentleman's recognized. Madam, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. One of the amendments in this in block amendment is an amendment by Congressman Deal of Georgia, who is who is not here, and I think it is worthy of some explanation. He he would set up a public information program, where the Secretary of Labor would would uh, make a quarterly calculation of the number of adversely affected workers receiving payments under Section 425, which is the Climate Change Worker Assistance Program. Now, in spite of the protestations of many of the supporters of this legislation that there is not going to be any negative economic impact, uh, there are close to 100 pages in the legislation going through the Climate Change Worker Adjustment Assistance Program, and workers who are eligible for such assistance include workers employed in the energy producing and transforming industry, industries dependent upon energy industries, energy intensive manufacturing industries, consumer goods manufacturing, and other industries whose employment the Secretary determines has been adversely affected by any requirement of Title VII of the Clean Air Act. So apparently somebody believes that in spite of what we have heard for the last four days, there are going to be some negative economic impacts. And in this bill, in addition to, in addition to the, the normal unemployment benefits that we have already, this creates an additional program, as I understand it, on top of. And so the deal amendment would simply say that, that you have to make a quarterly calculation of those adversely affected workers and put it up on a website that would be maintained by the Department of Energy. It is an informational amendment. So I would it is part of the end block, and I thought that deserved to uh, have some time. Um, and I think I would yield to Mr. Walden. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to speak toward the uh, Walden Amendment on hydropower. Um, and first of all, this is water. You pour it in here, and it's the same water you pour in here. 
No. And under this bill, this water going through one dam produces electricity that has no carbon footprint, but it's not renewable. If you go through a different one, it is, depending upon the year. And I'd like to know from the chairman why January 1 of 1992 was picked as the year after, before, before which this water that goes through this dam doesn't renewable, and if it goes through after it, it is. Who made the decision on 1992? Mr. Mr. Markey, can you inform me? Um, in the same way that 2005 is used as a benchmark or 2020 is used as a benchmark, um, that number uh, was uh, chosen uh, after um, considerable deliberation, reflecting upon uh, a large uh, set of construction projects that uh, actually had reached their culmination point during that time period. And okay. it was felt that it would make sense to include them I, uh, because it would help actually then in I, making I, I'm going to reclaim, okay. reclaim my time and go to the next piece of this amendment because I'm, I'm using up time here, but I'd love to get the list of those projects. Clause 3, however, on page 15, says that the hydro project installed on the dam is operated so that the water surface elevation at any given location and time that would have occurred in the absence of the hydroelectric project is maintained. In other words, if you put an electrical generation device on a dam, the energy produced for that device is not considered as new hydro and renewable if at any location or time the water behind that dam is affected by the addition of that electrical generating device, that turbine. I have talked to engineers from the Corps of Engineers who tell me it is physically impossible not to do that. And so therefore, while we've heard a lot of talk uh, on that side about how we're going to encourage new hydro, the practical and engineering effect of Clause 3 precludes that new hydro from ever being considered. Um, and so our amendment fixes both of these issues, and I, I urge its support. Does any member wish to be recognized in opposition to the on block amendment? Yes, Madam uh, Chairman. Gentleman from uh, California. Thank you. Um, I just want to respond to some comments by my uh, colleague from California, and I certainly uh, appreciate the concern about farm jobs. I have a lot of agriculture in my district, and uh, we're seeing huge decreases in the withdrawals for the Delta. But uh, the Delta smelt, which was referred to as the worthless worm, is the, belt, is the base of the Delta food chain, and it is going extinct. But it's only with, resulted in about 300,000 300, acre feet reduction. That's only 5% of the withdrawal from the Delta. Now, the real cause of the low, extremely low, damagingly low withdrawals is three consecutive years of very low rainfall, and that is consistent with global warming. I don't know if it can be blamed on or not, but certainly consistent, and 50 years of overdrafting the Delta. So I'm very concerned about blaming uh, uh, this bill, and we'll see that as we move forward for all the problems we're having in California and, the envir and other environmental laws for, for damaging the state. I think the environmental laws are making our state healthier and making our country healthier. For example, the Clean Water Act. Where would we be now without the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the amendments to the Clean Air Act in 1990? No, so I, uh, uh, the arguments that were given forth on that, I don't think uh, um, carry water. And so I urge my colleagues to, uh, to vote against that. Will, will the gentleman yield? Yes, I yield. Does the gentleman support the, 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 the closure of the pumps in the Delta due to the, the Delta smelt decision, the Wanger decision? The, the Delta withdrawal uh, is due to a very low Does the gentleman water. support the, the decision, the Wanger decision, to shut the pumps down for the Delta pump, for the Delta smelt? Uh, the, that decision was made in the judicial area, can, so I can't Can the I gentleman really from come, California uh, answer yes or no on that? No, the gentleman is not going to answer yes or no on that. Would the gentleman, I, I yeah, would the the gentleman, gentleman would the does gentleman support from, that decision? Uh, would the gentleman, gentleman from Cal I'm sorry. gentleman from California controls the time. Would the gentleman from California yield? Yes, I yield back to uh, the I, gentleman I, from, from I, Massachusetts. I thank the gentleman very much. And that just so that all members can know that the language in the bill has been endorsed by the National Hydropower Association. So. We're, I think, were they part, Mr. Chairman, will you yield? Gen were they part of? Gentleman from California. The gentleman from time. California has time. I just thought everyone should know that. that 
We'll, we think the language in the bill. Would the gentleman good. from California yield for a question to the, to the chairman of the committee since he raised the Hydropower Association? I just have a question. Did they give the list? The gentleman has not. Does the gentleman yield? Okay. okay, so thank you for yielding. Because my question is, so the Hydro Power Association, so they support Clause 3 on page 15? And did they provide the list of the facilities and come up with the date? The, uh, the National Hydro Power Association, in conjunction with American Rivers Association, uh, drafted the language in, uh, that is actually used for the production tax credit as well. So we, we tried to work with groups that, you know, are out there, and we believe that we reached a good uh, formula, uh, and we look forward to working with the gentleman in the, in the weeks uh, uh, ahead. And would, would you be willing to provide me that list of the dams or, or fa electric facilities since 92 that took you back to that 92 date? Because your we, discussion draft from the week before had a different date, and that's we, why. We, we will provide the information to them. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The gentleman from California yield back. The gentleman yields back. The vote now occurs on the on block amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Madam Chairwoman, we would ask for a roll call vote. Recorded vote has been requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher, no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Ms. Eshoo. No. Ms. Eshoo votes no. Mr. Stupak. No. Mr. Stupak, no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Ms. Gett. Ms. Gett, no. Mrs. Capps. Mrs. Capps votes no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon votes no. Ms. Joukowsky. Ms. Joukowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes no. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, no. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Melison. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes votes no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space votes no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. 
Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Rodanovich. Mr. Rodanovich votes aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick votes aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes no. Mr. Gordon. No. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green, no. Mr. Engel. No. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Melanson. I'm sorry, I can't see him. <laughs> votes no. Ms. Melanson votes no. Okay. Mr. Welch. Oh, Mr. Welch. Sorry. Mr. Welch votes no. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? The uh, clerk will tally the vote and announce the outcome. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 22 ayes and 36 noes. 22 ayes, 36 noes. The uh, amendment is not agreed to. General lady from uh, Ohio, Ms. Sutton, has an amendment at the desk. Without objection, it will be considered as read. Just to, well, wait a minute to have it distributed. recognized for five minutes on her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and hopefully this won't take near that long. Um, this amendment uh, addresses an issue. Currently, the Davis-Bacon provisions in this bill apply to carbon capture, capture and storage projects funded through the Carbon Capture and Storage Research Corporation, which is Section 115, and CCS deployment projects through the use of CCS bonus allowances, Section 114. And I, of course, strongly support these provisions, and I'm offering an amendment to apply Davis-Bacon throughout the bill. The amendment is designed to ensure that prevailing wage rates are paid to construction workers on all federally assisted construction activities related to this act. This amendment is essential to ensuring that the green jobs created by this bill are also good family-sustaining jobs. 
For example, under this bill, allowances are allocated to encourage the construction of clean energy resources, and other allowances are allocated for domestic adaptation activities. And in order to maintain the consistent application of Davis-Bacon to federally assisted construction, the community wage standards of the act should apply to those provisions of the bill. This amendment also includes an exemption under the Retrofit for Energy and Environment Environmental Performance Program for the residential bid program, and this exemption recognizes that individuals will be utilizing this program for upgrades to their home. Um, and in addition, there's an exemption for small businesses. Uh, those would be projects less than 6,500 square uh, feet, which is uh, premised on a, uh, a case codified in 1971 for post offices. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Uh, would the gentlelady yield to me? I will yield to the chairman. Uh, the the Davis-Bacon Act requires that workers on federally funded construction projects be paid no less than the wages paid in the community for similar work. Uh, this, lo this law prevents the federal government, which is a large, uh, influential construction owner, from using tax dollars to undercut local wage standards through its inv investments in construction work. It's important that we build a clean energy economy with good high-wage jobs and quality workers. And I strongly support uh, this amendment. Uh, the gentlelady yields back her time. I do. Uh, Mr. Barton. Um, very briefly, Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition. <coughs> um, I guess if we're going to pass a bill that um, uh, where cost is no object and what the price of anything is that's under this act, we might as well add a, an amendment to it that says um, uh, you have to have some sort of a, a minimum wage rate. I'm not opposed to workers having high wages, obviously, and I'm certainly not opposed on, uh, on f direct federal contracts uh, where the construction is a federal project uh, having a Davis-Bacon component, uh, but this act, this this amendment, if adopted, would say that any entity that receives emission allowances or funding <clears throat> under the act uh, would have to comply with with Davis, make a reasonable effort to comply uh, with Davis-Bacon. It does in, implicitly acknowledge that that might uh, be counterproductive because it does have an exemption uh, for residential buildings uh, and non-residential uh, commercial space that's, if I read it right, less than 6,500 square feet. So it implicitly acknowledged that there's the possibility that the wage rates paid might be above the market. So um, we thought there might be a germane question on this, Mr. Chairman, because it is Davis-Bacon. But since you're not changing the Davis-Bacon Act, you're just saying that it has to apply to this act, uh, our uh, parliamentarian has said that there is not a germaneness test. So we oppose it on policy grounds. would hope that um, it is not a, made a part of the act. The gentleman has the time. You and ready. I'll yield to Mr. Stearns. Uh, I thank the, chair, uh, the ranking member. I would like to ask counsel, um, <clears throat> if a family inherits a home from their, their father and mother, and it's a large home, and it's in Florida, Central Florida, and it turns out it's 6,505 square feet. It's a residential building. Would they have to hire, would they have to have Davis Bacon apply to them if they retrofitted this house based upon this act? My understanding of the amendment no. is that the residential definition in the retrofit program is completely exempted and that would include any single family home. It says here, if the net interior space of such non-residential building is less than 6,500 feet, so this is above that threshold, 6,505 feet. I thought you defined it as a family home. That's a residential building. Non-residential. Non okay, so all residentials are exempt. That's right. Okay, so if they had a uh, a small business uh, in a building that was 6,505 feet, uh, then what would happen? Then it would be defined as a non-residential property, and if they retrofitted the home 
pursuant to the provision of that act, and this amendment was part of the act. Okay. The Davis Bacon standards. And would apply. so they live in Florida, and so that that would apply, and they they couldn't do anything with a private contractor on this uh, commercial building. Well, they could choose any contractor they wanted as long as the wage standards under the Davis-Bacon Act were complied. Well, they put out a firm fix. They put out a price for a, for a, to fix this building. It turns out they get a lower price. And they don't even know about the Davis-Bacon Act, and they accept the lower price. What happens to them then? You're talking about, gentlemen, yield. You're talking about a violation of the Davis-Bacon Act. Well, I'm saying in this case, they get three estimates. Maybe one of them is lower, and they take it, and they don't know it's against the Davis-Bacon Act. So I guess, what happens to them then? Is well, there inspectors out here to confirm this in Central Florida that they have their commercial building um, actually retrofitted? If they were applying for federal money through the REAP program that came to the states and the Davis-Bacon Act would apply to their building, as a condition of obtaining that grant to pay up to half the cost of the retrofit, the Davis-Bacon conditions would apply. And if they were to use that money, they would have to meet the conditions of this, con of this provision and presumably would be guided by the state as to how to obtain the appropriate assurances that their uh, payment for their half of that um, and for Okay, the, I'll for just conclude, Mr. Chairman. Whole, what, is the fine the or what is the fine or penalty if they don't do this? I do not know the penalty. Um, Does the Chairman know what, what would happen to this uh, family if they retrofitted their home? No. Don't know. Don't know the answer. But I do know the time's up. Okay. We now go to the vote. All those in favor of the Sutton Amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The ayes have it and the amendment's agreed to. Mr. Chairman, could we have a roll call vote on that, please? Yeah, you do want a roll call please. vote. Please. Okay. Clerk will call the roll. Yeah. No, that's a... <coughs> we are getting near the end. I'm just talking to myself. We are getting near the end. <laughs> Mr. Waxman. Uh, Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Waxman, aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher, aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone votes aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, aye. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, aye. Ms. Eshoo. Ms. Eshoo votes aye. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Green. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes aye. Mr. Gett. Mr. Get, aye. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, aye. Mr. Ms. Schakowsky. Aye. Ms. Schakowsky votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Mr. Inslee. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Aye. Mr. Ross, aye. Mr. Weiner. Aye. Mr. Weiner votes aye. Mr. Matheson. Aye. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melanson. Aye. Mr. Melanson, aye. Mr. Barrow. Aye. Mr. Barrow votes aye. <coughs> Mr. Hill. Aye. Mr. Hill votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Ms. Matsui votes aye. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes. 
Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Space. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton. Aye. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Stearns. No. Mr. Stearns votes no. <laughs> Mr. Deal. Mr. Mr. Whitfield. No. Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus. Aye. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. No. Mr. Shattuck votes no. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Blunt, no. Mr. Boyer. No. Mr. Boyer votes no. Mr. Radonovich. No. Mr. Radonovich votes no. Mr. Pitts. No. Mr. Pitts votes no. Ms. Bono Mack. Well, they told me Ms. Bono Mack votes points. no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Terry. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, no. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan votes no. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Blackburn. No. Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Gingry. No. Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Scalise. No. Mr. Scalise votes no. Mr. Terry, not recorded. Thank you. No, not recorded. Votes no. Sorry. Vote no. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Mr. Terry votes no. There are some members still yeah. waiting to be called. Okay. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes aye. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, aye. respond to the roll. The uh, clerk has tallied the roll and we'd like to have the, uh, the outcome. On that amendment, Mr. Chairman, there were 39 yeas and 18 noes. 39 yes, 18 noes, no. uh, the uh, amendments agreed to. Uh, Mr. Inslee, and then we'll go to you. Mr. Inslee, are you ready? I am, Mr. Chair. I have uh, an amendment to offer. Uh, Gentleman has an amendment at the desk. Do you wish to offer it as an amendment? I do. I will uh, be offering him in bonk. It's Inslee uh, unnumbered and Inslee uh, uh, 4 9. I'd wish to offer, move to offer him in bonk. I'll be then separating the question and withdrawing one of them. <laughs> Without objection, the. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, point of order. Uh, Gentlemen, state his point of order. Aren't we rotating and like 
you folks just had one. Wouldn't we come to this side first before you go to your side again, just at normal, regular order? Uh, the, the gentleman shouldn't be concerned about it. Oh, I'm not. You have one amendment left on your side. We have a couple on our right. side. I'm not real concerned. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> that means we should get an amendment actually passed if we... You know, it's one thing to offer, Mr. Chairman. It's another thing to have them accept. Would, would the chairman yield? Who's asking me to yield Mr. to whom? Boyer. If we're gonna oh, Mr. Boyer, you're going to be you're going to be offering the next amendment. We're, we are, and we're going to do ours en bloc. So why don't you take your remain amendments, do them en bloc, and maybe we can uh, finish up the bill. Just a suggestion. Th thanks for the suggestion. So it's it's one we ought to. I, no, it's a helpful one. But uh, we have uh, different members on different issues, and I know I just, you know, it's some, you just they have different they have, deals made. They have rights. People have rights as individual members, and some are willing to right. put them together, and some not. And in this case, for example, by unanimous consent, I'd like to ask that Mr. Inslee be able to offer his two amendments in block, one of which he's going to uh, withdraw, as I understand it. But he hasn't offered, asked to withdraw it yet, so I'd like to recognize him. But uh, let's be sure we have unanimous consent that the two amendments be considered as read. And Mr. Inslee, you have two amendments, but you only get one five-minute period of time. And you're now recognized for that. Thank you. I will be as brief as duty permits. Um, the First Amendment, the one we hope to pass, and we may or may not have a vote on, but we will pass, is uh, Inslee 49. Basically, this uh, amendment will uh, create a loan guarantee program for the uh, adoption and perfection of, of high-capacity transmission technologies. We know that we have to substantially increase the capacity of our transmission system to deal both with increasing demands and the fact that renewable energy now requires a whole new dynamic of our transmission system. We know that whereas we used to be able to bring coal uh, to the generating plant, we can't bring wind to the generating plant or solar cell. We can't ship photons or wind to a central generating plant. We have to generate the electricity where they are located and then transmit them to the site where we need the electricity. So we know we need substantial changes in our transmission system. This is a proposal that Mr. Hoyer originally proposed in legislation that would essentially make high-capacity transmission technologies eligible for stimulus funding and create a loan guarantee uh, a program to help for their ad uh, uh, adoption. I just, we haven't had enough props in our hearing, so I can hold one up. This is a, a wire uh, by American Semiconductor, and they have basically, they have a system where by using uh, uh, super-cooled metals, they can create the same uh, capacity at like 150th the amount of volume of metal and less than one-fifth of the width of a, of, a, of a corridor. And we now have at least three places in the United States lines that are actually, number one, underground, don't have visual problems that bother our constituents, have a 50-foot uh, corridor rather than a 300-foot corridor, and have efficiencies in the area of 20 to 30 percent more efficient. So we want to move these technologies forward. We need to, the amendment simply would make this eligible uh, for uh, stimulus uh, funding and create a small $100 million uh, loan, or excuse me, grant program for the perfection of these technologies. It's one of the things we have to do. I'll be offering that amendment. The second amendment I will be uh, withdrawing. Uh, attempts to find a solution to our siting uh, challenges we have with our transmission system. We know how difficult it is to site transmission lines. All of us who are in public life understand that our constituents, Republicans and Democrats, share all one, two traits. We all want unlimited electricity and we want zero electric lines anywhere in our states and country. Reconciling those two things is difficult. The amendment I will offer and withdraw would propose a, a way to solve that problem or move forward by creating backstop siting authority for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It would suggest that if a state is unsuccessful in siting a line after three years, 
that the FERC would have jurisdiction then and only then to cite the line. The proposal we would make would suggest that that should be for lines that help fulfill utilities' obligation to provide renewable energy. It would also give great deference to states by requiring the recommendations of states to be followed as to citing even after the three-year period unless the FERC could find a reason that would make that a non-viable proposal. It would not expand the eminent domain authority but would be essentially the same as if states provided the, uh, the citing of these lines. Now the reason I have proposed this is it's just very clear that we have some responsibility that requires some heavy lifting. And that heavy lifting is to find a way to respond to the national challenge for a national grid. When we built our grid, it responded to local challenges and local generation capability. We now need a national system that will respond to the national challenge of dealing with global warming and really using the renewable energy sources that we have. So there may be many proposals to accomplish that. This is one. We have not been able to find consensus as of this moment on this subject, but I look forward to, to working with Mr. Markey, Mr. Waxman, to hopefully find a solution by the time we go to the floor. I want to note, I want to thank Mr. Markey particularly Before you thank for Mr. his Markey, efforts. Before you yield to me. And I will yield to Mr. Waxman. Let, let me express my strong feeling of, that we must have a transmission provision in this legislation, especially for the West. And, and the West needs the, um, uh, the interconnect and the ability to develop that uh, transmission. So uh, Mr. Markey, as chairman of the subcommittee, is going to hold hearings on it. And by the time we get to the House floor, I expect we're going to develop an amendment that we will uh, put into the legislation. We can't uh, uh, ignore the needs for the western part of this country, uh, wh while at the same time, of course, we need to uh, understand the concerns of the people on the east coast. But many of us live on the west coast, and we want this transmission issue resolved. You might want to yield to Mr. Markey. May the gentleman, without objection, gentleman is given an additional minute. Yield, Mr. No Markey. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I thank the gentleman very much for all of his work uh, on this. Um, legislation. There are many different stakeholders uh, involved in this issue. And uh, as the chairman said, uh, we think it's advisable for us to have a full-blown hearing on this issue with all of the stakeholders in the country uh, who are able to participate. But as um, the chairman said, towards the goal of developing a transmission piece for this legislation. Uh, and without question, the gentleman from Washington State uh, has uh, been the, you know, the driving force on, um, uh, on this issue, uh, and we intend to work with him as the leader towards developing that final product uh, that we can use in the legislation, and I thank the gentleman for all of his work. I appreciate that. I look forward to working here. Just one final comment. Uh, you know, this bill is going to require, in this challenge, some really heavy lifting by all of us, whether you're from a coal-fired state or a steel state or a hydro state, all of us are going to have heavy lifting here. That's certainly true on transmission, and I hope we can find a solution so we all share in that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Washington has withdrawn one of his amendments dealing with the transmission interconnect, and his, and his other amendment is still pending. Mr. Barton? I seek recognition to strike the requisite number of words. The gentleman's recognized. First of all, I'm I want to say that the amendment that he's not withdrawn, the uh, minority is prepared to accept. On the amendment that he did withdraw, um, we are, I would like to point out that the Republican alternative had a transmission siting uh, component to it. Uh, there were some differences. The gentleman's amendment that he's withdrawing is good as far as it goes. But in the eastern interconnection, it only applies uh, to states that are in that eastern interconnection. And the amendment that I saw earlier was for underground corridors, but this one apparently is above ground also. But it only applies to construct to projects that are for the renewable 
energy component, we're going to need transmission siting for all types of transmission, not just for renewable energy projects. So we stand prepared. Mr. Terry has worked on this amendment. Um, we had something similar to this in the Energy Policy Act of 2005 for what we called high intensity corridors between the states uh, that there was, a, I believe, a court challenge to. So the, the gentleman from Washington and gentleman from Nebraska have certainly um, um, identified an area that, that regardless of what happens to this particular bill, they have identified a problem that we need to address because our transmission grid uh, is, is out of date. Uh, it is subject to uh, blackouts. It is also subject to potential terrorist attacks. Uh, it was designed for a regulated market, which more and more we're, we're beginning to have a deregulated power market at the wholesale level. So we stand prepared to work with uh, Mr. Inslee, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Markey, and others to uh, try to solve this problem. Gentlemen, yielding me. Be happy to yield. I thank you very much for those words. I, 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 and that, it, to me, is very encouraging. We need to work together on these issues. This is, a, this is an important issue on transmission. And as Mr. Uh, Inslee said, it may be heavy lifting. This whole bill is heavy lifting. The whole problems of energy and uh, the demand for jobs and independence and uh, economic growth is, is hard to do. Is this time? Uh, we need to do it together. We may not be together today on the legislation that is going to pass out of committee, but let me extend a, an invitation to all the members, Democrat and Republican, let's sit down and work together as we uh, go forward because we, uh, I think, should try to reach uh, a point where we can support something on a bipartisan basis that the committee will put forward on the House floor. So I thank you for your comments. Mr. Uh, Barton, would you yield just for a moment, Mr. Barton? Happy to you. I want to thank you also for not uh, correcting me when I referred to these as semiconductors. They are superconducting lines, and I want to appreciate you not humiliating in the, in, in me in the eyes of the United States of America. I, I take care of that myself. Thank you very I, much. Thank you. I, it would be impossible for me to humili humiliate you. <laughs> but I, seriously, you have done an excellent job on this bill, and you're to be commended, not just on this section, but on all the sections. You have been an indefatigable proponent of this, and this you should have a uh, tremendous celebration this evening for the efforts you've made on behalf of this bill. The uh, vote now comes uh, after, uh, well, would you yield to, the, to Ms. Eshoo? Sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, thank you, and thank you to the ranking member for yielding his time. Even though this discussion comes very late, uh, in our markup, it is uh, nonetheless, as, as has been noted by uh, by the uh, speakers so far, how important it is. I'm I'm very pleased to co-sponsor uh, this effort at the committee. Uh, I mean, current transmission uh, lines are copper. Advanced composite is 30 percent more efficient. Superconducting is 60 percent more efficient. And uh, members should recall with some pleasure those that, uh, that voted for um, uh, the um, uh, 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 ARPA funds that, uh, that there are going to be monies available for this. Uh, and so from um, those that are going to apply the facil facilities and utilities, um, we're going to win in terms of having a much better grid in the country. So uh, this is really important. It bumps up the effort to a whole new level for our country. And so um, I'm pleased to uh, be part of the effort and glad that the uh, uh, ranking member supports it. Uh, I think it'll be good news for the country, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The vote... The <laughs> the, <laughs> the vote now comes on the... Uh, Inslee Amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendments agreed to. The chair would like to now call on uh, Mr. Boyer uh, to offer an amendment. Do you have just one amendment or other? I have other? one end block amendment, which will be the last amendment on the Republican side, given that you have no more amendments. Well, we do have some amendments on the Democratic side, but. How, how many amendments do you have on your side? 
Because we actually, we got like 400 more if you want us to go. You've been very generous in taking up our time <laughs> in this markup. But uh, I, I don't uh, want to be criticized for not calling on a Republican well, to offer I, an amendment at this point. If you prefer, well, we can have some more how many, how many amendments does, does your side have? Because what we're trying to do is trying to be helpful here, Mr. Chairman. We're taking I, eight I, amendments and making them in block to be cooperative here. And there may be a couple of people that will be There's two that will be offered and voted on. Okay. I mean, we have two amendments on our side that will be offered and voted on, and there may be, uh, there'll be several, I don't know how many, will be offered and withdrawn. Does that make you want to go now with yours, or do you want to wait? No, I think, I think uh, we'll, we'll take, show your hand. <laughs> have you brought up Title IV? To the bill? Oh, the, the bill's been open for amendment at any point for a very long time. Oh, All right. Well, I'll, I will reserve the right to offer this amendment and allow you to go next. All right. Mr. Space. Mr. Space. Oh, just a minute. I did promise Mr. Matheson. Oh. You don't care? The, Mr. Space. Mr. Space, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. And the gentleman from Ohio is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a relatively simple but important amendment, to particularly for uh, agricultural producers who are affected by the bill. Uh, the bill itself uh, provides offset credits for certain uh, agricultural activities. Uh, section 732 uh, is the, is the uh, section that provides for those credits. Section 733 defines those credits somewhat uh, Vaguely, we did attempt to uh, resolve that by way of an amendment earlier today, uh, but uh, at the chair's uh, suggestion that we would work on those issues, that amendment was withdrawn. Notwithstanding that offset uh, activity uh, credit uh, remains in the bill, uh, Section 734 currently imposes a requirement that with limited exceptions, uh, these activities uh, which are subject to offset credits are eligible for those credits only if they started after January 1st, 2009. The theory being that we want to reward uh, people who begin uh, these new activities in capturing carbon. Uh, the problem is that uh, by limiting these offsets only to those projects began after January 1st, 2009, uh, we're prejudicing those who have engaged in those activities in advance who are essentially at the head of the curve when it comes to climate change uh, conduct. Uh, one example that comes to mind is no-till uh, plowing or no-till uh, practices uh, in the agricultural community. Uh, if you have two farmers, one uh, who engaged in no has been engaging in responsible practices for the last five years, no-till plowing, for example, uh, on one side of the road, and then on the other side of the street, a farmer that has never engaged in it but begins to engage in the activity after January 1st, 2009, the more irresponsible farmer will get the offset credit, the responsible farmer will not. Uh, and although this may sound a bit mundane to most of the members of this committee, it's actually very important to those farmers who want to participate in this bill. Uh, so it's not only unfair to those farmers who have been proactive, uh, it's also encouraging uh, farmers that have been engaging in the no-till practices it will encourage them to cease that activity for a defined period of time and then reinitiate, and that circumvents the uh, very intent and purposes of the bill. Uh, so what this amendment essentially provides, and it is uh, the uh, material part of the amendment is in subsection B2, uh, uh, that will uh, provide that the activity that the uh, individual seeks uh, an offset for must have uh, begun after January 1st of 09, except with regard to activities that are easily and readily reversible uh, and where the administrator determines that to change the date would remove the incentive to cease and then reinitiate. It's a rather uh, complicated uh, uh, and complex uh, analogy, but it's one that applies especially to those uh, relatively far or small uh, family farms. Uh, this should be a somewhat non-controversial uh, amendment, and uh, we're asking that uh, 
the body of this uh, committee approve this amendment. Gentlemen, yield to me. I, 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 uh, I think this amendment is a good one, and I urge members to support it. You are allowing the offsets for projects that have been done in anticipation of, uh, of, of, of uh, the, the uh, re controls. Is that? If, if, if uh, yes. the chairman would yield back uh, the time. Uh, not necessarily in anticipation of the legislation, but there are farmers right now in Ohio's 18th district, for example, that are and have been for several years engaging in no-till uh, practices in, in, uh, on their farms. And they've been doing it because it was the responsible thing to do, it was the right thing to do, and not necessarily for any kind of monetary gain. What this bill will do, as it's written now, is reward those farmers who commence engagement in no-till practices, but it won't reward those farmers who have been doing it for several years. So this amendment is designed to give the administrator of the EPA the authority to look back uh, and, and uh, capture those people that have been doing it to give them the full credit of the carbon catch, uh, capture offset. I, I think it makes a great deal of sense. Mr. The Chairman's Chairman. time, uh, you, you back the balance of your time? I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barton. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know the hour's late and we want to catch planes or go eat supper or, depending on your mood, go have a drink because you're so despondent about this passing or <laughs> whatever. But my good friend from Ohio has just highlighted one of the real problems in this legislation. We're going to give credit if this becomes a part of the bill, and since you said you support it, it's going to, for activities that have already occurred that may or may not have been intended to get credits simply because somebody made a decision sometime after January the 1st, 2001 to do something that they thought made sense but now will qualify for offsets that can be, become a commodity that can be sold. My great-grandfather had three windmills on his farm in Whitney, Texas in 1890. <laughs> if you use this logic and change that date from January the 1st, 2001 to January the 1st, 1890, he would be eligible if he were alive. Will the gentleman yield uh, I'd be happy time? to yield. Uh, that is a legitimate, entirely legitimate concern that you have, uh, and uh, I believe that this amendment addresses that concern because it confines uh, the ability to take advantage of this exception to those cases where it's not just simply easily reversible, but in those cases where the administrator finds that there is an incentive for people who are engaged in smart, uh, responsible practices to stop doing so and then re-engage or re-initiate after a period of time so that they can then become eligible. In your, your case, in your, your grandfather's case, he's not likely to tear those windmills down and then rebuild them after a period of time to take advantage of the credit. In this case, uh, with the no-till practices, all a farmer would have to do is stop behaving responsibly after a period of time, re-engage in the practice, and then he's eligible for the credits. And in that interim gap, it, 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 we're going to be seeing an additional influx of carbon into the atmosphere, and it, uh, I think it obviates and uh, is counterproductive to the purpose of the bill. Well, reclaiming my time, is, uh, if you're going to have a cap-and-trade program, which I don't think we need, but that's beside the point, it makes sense to have an offset component. But we've already, I think we've shown in the debate, and I think we've got instances that when you have offsets, they are extremely subject to abuse and to fraud. And for the life of me, with all due respect, I don't see why we're accepting something that is retroactive. At least make your offset program proactive so that it doesn't kick in until the act actually kicks in. And I mean, I think you're going to be amazed at how many projects all of a sudden seem to qualify because they were commenced in the early 2000s. And then you're going to get pressure to come in and say, well, you know, we did that same thing in 1995. So maybe we ought to retroactively go the date even a little bit farther back. I mean, you're setting a terrible precedent, Mr. Chairman, by, and I'm not discounting the, the sincerity of the author of the amendment, 
But uh, this is going to be a nightmare. It's going to be abused. There are going to be millions or hundreds of millions of dollars uh, fraudulently um, um, claimed under this program, and it, it, I just would hope that we wouldn't accept it. But I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. The vote now comes on the space amendment. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The ayes have it, and the amendment's agreed to. Uh, Mr. Boyer, I want to recognize you at this time. How many further amendments, Mr. Chairman? Do you, either, do you, have? E do you wish to be recognized or not? Do you have more amendments? It, we have uh, a Matheson amendment, a Gonzalez colloquy. Uh, the Matheson amendment is going to be withdrawn. Mr. Rush ha wants to be recognized. He can engage in a discussion. And then there is a manager's amendment. And that manager's amendment would require an actual vote. Would you prefer us to go with our manager's what? amendment? Yes. Okay. I'm offering it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Am I offering it? Okay. I, I have a, an amendment at the desk. And without objection, that amendment will be considered as read. And I'd like to have uh, five minutes to discuss it. The manager's amendment. <laughs> Is this the clean version of the manager's amendment? The manager's amendment makes a number of, uh, of technical, uh, conforming, and uh, other changes that I don't that I don't believe are controversial. In fact, we've uh, uh, shared this amendment with Mr. Barton, and he and his staff have had a chance to review it. And I don't believe that there's any problem that he has with this. Mr. Amendment. Chairman, we're prepared to accept the amended manager's amendment, the revised version. I could discuss it in more detail, but I think I had to stop while I'm ahead. A point of, so, point of order, Mr. Chairman. Has Mr. your manager's Mr. amendment been at the desk for two hours? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you'll be honest about the, uh, it. We've known about it for over two hours, I will say no, that. No, but I think the question is, I'm just curious of whether the... Uh, the answer to the gentleman's inquiry is yes. Now, uh, the vote comes on the manager's amendment as amended. Well, the manager's amendment. As All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendments agreed to. Uh, Mr. Matheson, I recognize you next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The uh, amendment will be be accepted. The amendment will be uh, considered as read, and the gentleman's recognized for th five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm offering an amendment uh, in order to help or address issues related to small business refiners. Small refiners are found in 22 states in this country, including those owned by farm cooperatives. There's a high concentration of small business refiners in the interior west. They're essential to fuel supply in that area, and there are very few alternative suppliers, if any. Governors from Wyoming, South Dakota, and New Mexico support assistance for these refiners. Other members of Congress have also written to the committee in support of action. Uh, small refiners are in a different position than large refiners. And this is, by the way, small refiners are defined in federal government. A small business definer is, is an entity that refines less than 205,000 barrels a day. They're in a different position and have more exposure than large refiners just because larger companies have international facilities and greater scales of economy. So what this amendment does is it tries to address that issue for small business refiners by providing 1 percent of allowances from the unallocated pool to help these refiners. It's targeted assistance it would phase out in 2025. Um, this amendment tries to balance transitional assistance with expectations of transitioning to a low carbon economy. And Mr. Chairman, I would now yield to you. I thank you very much for yielding. Uh, Chairman? To, to me. Yes. Uh, if I could, uh, the gentleman would yield. Well, the uh, gentleman yield to me, and then I'm sure he'd oh, be okay. happy to yield thank to you, you. next. Uh, since he does have time available. I, I, I understand what the gentleman uh, is, is attempting to do, and I'm very sympathetic to that. Uh, I want to work with the gentleman and others on the committee who have an interest in this matter and, and uh, prepare uh, a possible amendment on the House floor to address this concern. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Green, do you still want me to yield? 
Here. Well, Mr. Chairman, first I would say I'd accept his amendment, <laughs> but I understand. Um, our 2 percent was negotiated included both large refiners and small refiners. In fact, we have refiners who have small refineries that would fit under what we would consider a small refinery, but put together they would be pretty large. But uh, I appreciate the Chairman's uh, um, support for trying to address this issue and hopefully increase it to uh, a percentage higher on the House floor. And I just want to uh, thank you for your work. And, and again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your work with us. No, I, I really appreciate it, Mr. Chairman, and look forward to working with us as the bill moves forward. The gentleman, I'll, I'll, gentleman I'll, withdraws his amendment. I'll withdraw, yes, I'll withdraw the amendment and I'll yield back. And yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Gonzal uh, Mr. Martin? Yeah, I'd like to seek recognition and strike the requisite number of words. Uh, gentlemen, recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the gentleman from Utah for his efforts here. I would also like to thank Mr. Green for his efforts. I will point out, if you really want to help refiners, because you're not having a special exemption for some of the tailpipe emissions, the refiner allowance program needs to be 44 percent. So you're at 2 percent. Mr. Matheson wants to go to 3 percent. If you really want to hold harmless the, the motorists of America, you ought to put 44 percent. The problem if you do that, you go over 100 percent in terms of free allowances, which is a problem even for this new Democrat majority. So, you know, 2 percent, 3 percent. Gentlemen, yield to me. I'd be happy to yield. Uh, I disagree with the gentleman's statement, but I really, at this late date, at this late hour, I really don't want to go into all the debate about it, but I'd be I'm happy sure to discuss with you further why I don't think your argument uh, is, is, would be justified and your suggestion would be justified. Uh, but I, uh, it, I'll accept the fact that we might have a disagreement about it, but I, I think if we had an opportunity to talk it over, you could see our point of view. I would certainly listen, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like this opportunity and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to enter into a colloquy with you regarding emission allowances. I know you've been waiting for this with baited CO2 breath. The local distribution companies bring in new plants online in the next few years. I don't think members understand that there may be as many as 10 just on this side of the aisle that would be impacted, but there would be consequences because of the timing of getting the permit, the license, the construction, and when they would come online. The original draft inadvertently left these facilities out of the calculation for allowances, and several local distribution companies would have faced a situation whereby they would have had to purchase significantly more allowances from day one under the rules of this bill, instead of being covered by the LDC allocation presently described in the bill. In the case of San Antonio, the municipally owned LDC would have had to raise rates to cover the additional cost to deliver electricity to meet the basic need that would have diluted the consumer protections that were incorporated into the bill. While I agree with the goals of the legislation, that is to reduce CO2 emission, I do not believe it would be fair if those local utilities, which are adding capacity in the immediate future to meet their baseload needs, would have to begin at a disadvantage. In comparison to other electricity LDCs, the only difference is that their additional facility won't come online by the date of this legislation, despite the financial investment having been made, the permitting process having been completed, and the construction being underway. The amendment in the nature of a substitute does include language to address the concerns of these local distribution companies which have facilities coming online after 2009, but not later, than 2012. However, it is in need of a correction to properly determine how to calculate those emissions for plants having less than three years of operation. The proposed fix in the bill we are about to vote on today is a very strong first step in that direction, but I would hope that I would have the commitment from the chairman that we will continue to work to address the deficiency in the language as it exists. If the gentleman would permit, I thank you for raising this issue. Our staffs have worked together on it. And I want to assure you that we'll, uh, we'll continue to work together uh, as the process moves forward. You've raised a, an issue of great concern. Thank, Thank you, you very much, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Who Chairman. seeks uh, Mr. Rush? Oh, Mr. Dingle. 
Mr. Chairman, I want to compliment you for the way that you've handled this and express my thanks to you for the fair way in which you have considered the concerns of the members and think that we have basically a good bill. I do want to make just one small remark, and, and I, I hope my friend Mr. Engel is around here because I want him to hear what I have but to have to say. I have great respect for him, and he's a, a fine member and a good friend. Uh, he wants to use our imported uh, rather to use uh, flex fuels instead of imported oil. So do I. But uh, there's language in, in the statement of managers which I find to be most curious. First of all, it requires, or rather allows the Secretary of Energy to mandate light duty vehicles to be flex fuel vehicles. But understand, not all flex fuels, but only E85 and M85. Now, M85 is an interesting fuel because its major component is methyl alcohol, which is made by burning coal. It is also interesting that this wonderful substance it happens to be a deadly toxic substance which can impair the health of people simply by falling on the skin of the individual concerned. Now, it's particularly interesting because although we've been trying to stimulate the production of alternative fuels and flex fuels, uh, we find that E85 is available in less than 1% of all fuel stations in the country. And we've had hearings in this committee on this matter during under, under my chairmanship to try and see that we did something about this. Now, we find, however, the fuel is not available in quantities enough to meet the current demand, let alone any future demand that might be anticipated. Congress mandated, as you will recall, 36 billion gallons of renewable fuels to be produced by 2022. But even assuming that the RFS of 36 billion gallons can be met, this will still just represent 20 percent of the total gasoline fuel, and half of 20 percent will be E10. Where the fuel for these flex vehicles will come from, nobody knows. The fuel, uh, the fuel infrastructure isn't there to justify these mandates and the cost of industry to, and, uh, cost to industry and consumers. Now, it should be noted that the cost of this is relatively minor. It costs another 100 to $200 a car. Well, we're going to have a lot then of cars for which consumers are going to be paying an extra $100 or $200 and driving around the country, hunting for places where they could put in the flex fuels which the car is capable of using. This will, of course, also require significant subsidies from the taxpayers. Having said this, um, it should be noted that uh, we are not going to have uh, the, the flex fuels available at any, t at any time in the foreseeable future. So this is a, a, a total error in that we have gone about creating a lot of cars for which there will be no fuel. It's my hope that somebody around here will realize that this is not a good thing to do and that we will set about then doing, then doing something which will make sense, and that is instead of stimulating the productions of cars which can't find a useful fuel, that they will then set about creating a useful fuel for which we have right now too many cars to properly fuel the fuels, or rather to fuel the vehicles. Now again, I respect my, I, I respect my colleague, Ms. Ringel, and, and his goal is a, is a desirable one, but his mechanism for achieving it is an erroneous one. And if we intend to do something here about addressing the problem that we confront with regard to global warming and loading the uh, atmosphere with uh, carbon, uh, this, this portion of the amendment is not the right way to address it. So I, I will perhaps be filing a minority view on this, and I, and I will be working between now and the time we get on the floor to find a more rational way of addressing this, this situation. And I will look forward to working with you and hopefully with Mr. Engel to achieve some kind of a sensible or a, a conclusion to what is a, a, a work of great enthusiasm, but rather diminished effectiveness. And I thank you, and I yield back the balance. Would, would Mr. Uh, Dingle uh, yield?
Certainly, I'll be glad. Thank to. you. Yeah, Maybe thank you can you. explain uh, why why I why I have to be concerned about these things. Well, I I, I uh, thank you. You've got a uh, fine amendment. It just doesn't work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm. Uh, I'm uh, glad that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, discuss this, and I certainly respect uh, your concerns, and I certainly uh, take them uh, very, very seriously. But uh, I have uh, concerns as well. Um, I am concerned uh, that um, uh, the United States of America for too long has been addicted to oil, uh, to, to foreign oil, and I believe with all my heart uh, that the only way that we can wean ourselves off of Middle Eastern and, and foreign oil is to make uh, this country uh, energy uh, independent. I would think the, that would, this... If the gentleman would permit me to make an observation... Certainly. He's requiring the manufacture of large numbers of automobiles, or potentially large numbers of automobiles, but there is no fuel available for those vehicles. Well... This is the most curious thing. If my good friend wants to address this problem, let's, let's address the fuel and the supply side as opposed to addressing this other matter in this other curious way. Well, the so gentleman what you... the gentleman has done has been to create a situation where there's going to be all these flex fuel vehicles driving around looking for a place that they can get flex fuel. He's done nothing to address the supply side. Well, if the gentleman will yield back to me, per perhaps I can... The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I want to yield uh, uh, two minutes to Mr. Engel, and then I want to yield uh, time to Mr. Barton, and then I think we've just got to move on, folks. So, Mr. Engel is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's hard to do this in two minutes, but I'll, tr I'll try my, my best. Um, uh, I uh, visited a country uh, like Brazil, which uh, every uh, car manufactured in Brazil was a flex fuel car. And when you drive into a gasoline station in Brazil, you can get uh, ethanol, methanol, or gasoline. I believe it creates competition, and I believe that's very important. I also believe, uh, Chairman Dingle's point, is that it becomes a catch-22. If you don't have the vehicles uh, that will uh, use this kind of uh, fuel, uh, then you won't have the fuel. I believe if you build the vehicles, uh, you will then get the fuel. I also believe very strongly that it would cost $90 or $100 at most per car to do this. And I think that's a very small price to pay uh, to make us energy independent. While we are moving to solar and wind and all those other things, we cannot get from step one to step ten overnight. And I think this gives us another vehicle. If we're talking about plug-in electric vehicles, uh, they can be flex fuel as well. So when, when the President of the United States, and I commend him, uh, announces that uh, for $1,300 more a car, he's going to increase cafe standards, which I applaud, uh, I think for $90 to $100 a car, uh, we could do this uh, in America and make every car flex fuel. And frankly, I am perplexed uh, why the automobile uh, industry is lobbying so heavily against this. Uh, maybe they ought to get into the real world and, and understand that the reason why people aren't buying cars is because they're not doing the kinds of things that the American public wants, and they've resisted these changes for years and years. Uh, they thankfully have stopped resisting the change uh, towards better cafe standards with the president, but they're still resisting these changes with, uh, with lobbyists and everything else here trying to block it. Um, I think that what we want in this country is energy independence, and I think that flex fuel cars are one of the ways to go. And frankly, I, I would be delighted to work with, with Chairman Dingell on a way to make this happen, whether it's on the, on the supply side with the fuel or whether it's making more vehicles. But we have to do this. And this language, I think, is a small step in that direction. We need to go even further. And I would hope that we can go further uh, before the time uh, the bill uh, hits the floor uh, of the House for us to vote on it. And I thank uh, Chairman Waxman for uh, being generous with his time. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. It's good to see democratic unity on display in the committee. I, um, it does show, it, it, and I mean this seriously, I don't appreciate the work product, but I do appreciate the work effort that you and Mr. Markey have exhibited in bringing the bill this far. It is truly remarkable to see what you all have been able to accomplish. But I want to encourage my good friend from Michigan. Uh, he can do more than file a minority report. He can vote with me against the bill. And I, if he can bring Mr. Stupak and a few others, uh, we can start over. And uh, I guarantee my friend from Michigan, we can make him very, very happy. Um, <laughs> with that, I want to yield to uh, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you. And I had promised not to speak, but of course, the renewable fuels debate compels me. Um, 
because of what we said before. This is a debate that should have been in a manager's amendment. Elliot Engel is right. In, in this Congress, under Republican leadership and, and well, under Democrat leadership, have pushed renewable fuels. You are, you are part of this now acceptance of renewable fuels as being an option in the liquid fuel debate. You, you have accepted this baby. Now, now you have to help nurture it. To cut it off before it entered grade school would be a great disservice. In my district, I can get from, all, and I represent parts of 30 counties in southern Illinois, I can fill up continuously with E85. I've had E85 vehicles three different congressional terms. This is the only thing we've done to reduce our reliance on imported crude oil, renewable fuels. And this cost to the, to the manufacturers is so small that it's crazy not to have choices. It's just crazy. So I, I, I'm really taking offense at what the Chairman Emeritus has done. And I, Elliot, I'm with you, buddy. Let's fight it. Before we uh, get into a fight, let me uh, move on to another subject. But I want to say to all my colleagues that we have difference of opinion. I don't want to get corny about it. But we all want the same goals, and we have to work together. Get, get the pun, corny? Anyway, um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Rush? You're no Ed Markey, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> You're right. Mr. But, Rush. But, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman, when we started this markup, uh, in my opening statement, I said that this was a good bill, and after three days, I still believe that it's a, 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 a great bill. I think the bill would have been even much greater uh, had uh, I been able to overcome some of the jurisdictional uh, barriers uh, with the uh, Ed Labor Committee, because uh, had I been able to uh, successfully overcome those uh, uh, arguments, uh, then I would have offered an amendment that would cover, would have covered construction projects funded or assisted by this, uh, by the underlying bill. And uh, my amendment would have provided a unique opportunity to, to target quality green jobs and training programs and opportunities to low-income and underrepresented workers. Uh, communities who traditionally have been left out of the opportunities to share uh, in our nation's prosperity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, without strong requirements, uh, low-road contractors uh, could predominate on projects covered under this act, and they uh, will, uh, possibly would fail to provide job training, and they would squander a chance to build middle-class construction careers in a new a green economy that works for all of us. Uh, states and cities have pioneered the use of targeted hiring uh, and apprenticeship requirements on public funding construction projects all across this country. They've demonstrated some of the best practices for ensuring job quality and equitable access to employment and training opportunities. And Mr. Chairman, my proposal uh, was supported uh, by a broad coalition of advocates for green jobs, for workers' rights, for job training and economic justice, including Green for All, the National Employment Law Project, the Partnership for Working Families, the Center for Community Change, and the Campaign for Community Values, uh, and the uh, Transportation Equity Network, and many, many others. Uh, the principles reflected in my proposal resulted from many months of discussion with key stakeholders, including the Building and Construction Trades Department of the AFL-CIO. Uh, the proposed language would have targeted uh, jobs to low-income local workers. Contractors would have had to ensure that a percentage of project work hours are worked uh, by either low-income worker, local workers or by women, uh, and the minimum percentages, uh, percentages would have ranged from 10 percent with a goal of at least 30 uh, percent. It would have also in, uh, ensured quality job training opportunities where certified apprenticeship uh, programs or, uh, were located near a project, and contracts would have had to maximize, maximize the use 
of registered uh, apprentices. And this would have generated quality job training opportunities and promoted uh, use of high road contractors. Uh, lastly, Mr. Chairman, my uh, proposal uh, would have uh, supported quality pre-apprenticeship training programs uh, and 1% of each project's funds would have been dedicated to pre-apprenticeship training uh, programs that would have had a strong record of training low-income workers and these programs would have helped to provide pathways into long-term long middle-class construction careers and ensure a pipeline of workers ready to step into new apprenticeship positions. And Mr. Chairman, this is an issue that won't go away. It's extremely important to me and to my district. And Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you to address this matter, these issues, before the bill comes to the House floor. And with gentlemen, that, I yield back the balance. Well, gentlemen, yield just to me for, to, to, to acknowledge uh, that you've made a, 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 a very powerful point and we want jobs and we want to make sure we get them to a lot of the people who need them the most. And while what you wanted to do was so worthwhile and I think would have had strong bipartisan support, it's not within the jurisdiction of our committee. But I'm going to work with you and our colleagues on the other committees and see if we can uh, make this happen. And I want to commend you for your, your compassion and your concern and your commitment uh, to, the, to the, the working people and the people who want to be working people in this country. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Back, uh, Ms. Blackburn, gentlelady from Tennessee, I want to recognize you for five minutes. Did you have an amendment you want to offer? Yes, Mr. Chairman. W without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. Gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Amendment. Chairman. And as you are aware, I will offer and withdraw. But this is an issue that has not been addressed in this entire bill. My amendment, which is a Title IV amendment, it would create a Section 4 47 would create a sense of Congress. It is a sense of Congress regarding intellectual property rights. My amendment seeks to protect U.S. intellectual property in two ways. Number one, by encouraging the administration to not agree to any international climate change accord that contains exceptions to intellectual property rights that will hurt U.S. businesses and workers, and number two, to limit countries eligible for U.S. foreign aid authorized by the legislation to only those that have demonstrated a commitment to protecting IP rights. Strong IP rights also help to facilitate technology transfer to other countries, a purported goal of the underlying legislation by providing companies the confidence to engage in foreign direct investment, joint ventures, partnerships, and licensing agreements internationally. If the U.S. agrees to weak IP protection in a rush to adopt international agreements, it will stifle critical R&D investments in the new technology and slow its deployment. The first part of the amendment says that IP must not be neglected or used as a bargaining chip. The second part of the amendment expresses the sense of Congress that U.S. tax dollars not be used by other nations to purchase state-of-the-art U.S. technology, which might subsequently be reproduced by foreign companies or counterfeited and used domestically or exported to other markets, including our own. In either case, the results would be the same, lost jobs for U.S. workers, lost revenue for U.S. companies, and less incentive to invest in future clean technologies. The stats that I have to back this up, and this is why I feel like it is so important that we consider this, this issue. And Mr. Chairman, I would ask that we please consider this before the bill goes to the floor. U.S. inventors hold 50 percent of the world's U.S. patents granted in the clean energy field over the period from 2002 to 2008. The U.S. leads the world with 52 percent of U.S. patents in fuel cells. We hold nearly half the world's granted U.S. wind patents that have been granted since 2002. That is 48 percent of those. 46 percent of the world's U.S. solar patents the U.S. holds 40 percent of the world's granted U.S. patents in the hybrid electric vehicle market. And I will mention that the three states at the top of the heap on holding these patents are California, 
Tennessee, and Ohio. We know that our American engineers and innovators are leading the world in creating clean energy ideas. It is imperative that we as members of Congress demonstrate our intent to protect the innovators' intellectual property rights before embarking on any plan to combat international climate change. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to working will with the, you on the issue. Will the gentlelady lady yield just for a second? Yes, I will yield to Mr. Stearns. Uh, I just wanted to ask counsel, um, as she makes some very good points, um, and she talks in her bill about the United States funding directly other countries and meeting the costs of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions or adapting to the impacts of climate change. How much money is in the bill for um, assisting other countries in meeting their greenhouse gas emissions? Section 782, provi uh, uh, Section 782 provides allowance value for those purposes. So how do we, we help, it says, it says uh, that uh, meeting the cost of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, how do we do that and how much money is involved? Does anyone on, on the Democrat side know? Uh, gentlemen, you, we don't know, but we'll get you an answer. <laughs> well, the council doesn't know either then, huh? I mean, is it uh, less than... We'll, uh, we'll get you an answer. Is it? Does anybody know ballpark how much we're talking about? The allowance price will be set by the market, and we'll have to see what the market will bring. Uh, but we don't have an answer for you at this time, or even a, a, a good estimate, or even a, a an energy. Well, we don't have a good estimate for you. We'll get. We'll have to get that for you. Gentle ladies, time has expired. Mr. Boyer, you have an end block amendment. Uh, without objection, the end block amendments. If you'll identify, I think you already identified them. No, I, I have not. Okay, would you identify the amendments you wish Chairman, to offer? I reserve a Chairman, the order. N block uh, request will be eight amendments. Eight amendments. Uh, it will be, uh, mine is, is identified as CCA 09 097. It's Booyer 100% CDC allocation. Number two is the Burgess 032 regarding international offsets. Then there are the next uh, one, two, three, four, five amendments are from Mr. Upton, identified as MPB 2564. Next is MPB 2565. Next is MPB 2566. Next is MPB 2567. Next is MB, B, MPB 2568. And the last amendment would be Scalise. 001A regarding a five year reauthorization of Title III. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the members have heard the identification of the amendments, and the amendments are being distributed, and the uh, gentleman is recognized to speak on his amendments. And he has five minutes. He can yield time to others, but it's his five minutes on behalf of the Unblock Amendment. The, um, I'll first uh, identify Mr. Burgess's uh, amendment regarding international offsets. He seeks to strike the international offset authority. Uh, Mr. Burgess is seeking to, uh, that the allowances go to the source of emissions. Regarding the, uh, uh, the Booyer amendment is I have great concerns about the proposal before us uh, would award individual utility emissions permits based on a percentage of their emissions and retail sales I believe this results in a windfall revenue for those regions in the United States with zero or low emissions and is a disproportionate burden to those who are dependent on fossil fuel. Indiana in particular, fossil fuel depend dependency is 99.6 percent. So I uh, did a little math. So when I go back and I do the math, uh, the data uh, compiled by EIA sales data and extrapolation of the NERC subregion data and EPA emissions data. What I have learned is that for a typical Indiana utility, NIPSCO or PSI, they would get under the present scheme in the bill 0.55 to 0.57 allowances per ton of emissions. Now a typical California utility, I'll choose Southern Cal Edison or PG&E, 
they would get 1.34 to 1.63 allowances per ton of emissions. In other words, they're going to have more than they, than they need to sell back to the Midwest and other parts of the country. For a typical Washington utility, for example, Puget Sound or Seattle City Light, Puget Sound would receive 0.96 allowances per ton of emissions that they are responsible for, and Seattle gets 4.86 allowances per ton that they're responsible for. So, Southern Cal uh, Edison gets 2.43 times the allowances per ton of CO2 emissions than a utility in Indiana, and PG&E gets 2.97 times more than one in Indiana. Seattle City Light gets 8.84 times the allowances per ton of CO2 emissions in Indiana, and Puget Sound gets 1.7 times uh, the amount of, uh, of munitions. So I, I, this allocation formula, I think, would be better if it's based on the carbon content of fuel that is a much better mechanism to lower the costs to consumers. With that, I would like to, to yield one minute to Mr. Scalise of Louisiana to discuss his amendment. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Indiana. This amendment just places a five-year sunset on the bill, just like so many other things we do here in Congress. Earlier today, FAA just got reauthorized. Highway bill has to get reauthorized. If you look at this bill, and of course, if all the predictions on the other side are correct and all the jobs would be created that they say and no job loss would occur, there'd be a line from here to Maryland to reauthorize the bill. But if, on the other hand, a lot of the things that we've suggested and so many outside experts have suggested, and even your own bill suggests, that there could be massive unemployment, jobs going to China and India, as well as more carbon being emitted because they would be done in countries that don't have our regulations, then we should have a stopgap measure in place to give a protection that this has to be reauthorized. The word unemployment is in this bill at least 16 times. There's over 50 pages dedicated to unemployment. Then they get into to words like partial separation, adversely affected employment 46 times. That's the same thing as unemployment. <laughs> We've talked about off-ramps. There's a title they even start using political correctness and say bridge to retirement instead of unemployment. Uh, so there's all kind of terms in here, f over 50 pages dealing with unemployment. If that happens, this should at least be and have some kind of accountability in place so that the taxpayers, the people that would be unemployed because of this right. bill okay. should be able to have some thank, relief. Thank you, Mr. Scalise. I now yield the remaining time to Mr. Upton. I, I want to thank the gentleman for, for carrying this amendment. Uh, my amendments uh, really do protect the consumers. We know the Michigan story. Things are bad, expected to get worse. And if things in the rest of the, if, if the uh, economic climate in the rest of the country follows Michigan's poor lead, we are in real trouble. And what my series of amendments does is this. And by the way, we heard today from Mr. Radonovich that I guess electric utility increases in the state of California are going up 11 percent, and that's before this bill uh, gets enacted. But if this bill gets enacted and things continue to get worse for the rest of the country, we provide an off-ramp. We say that, that the bill is uh, these provisions uh, will be sunset if utility account terminations reach 8 million households. The second bill, we say that it's sunset if gas arrearages hit an average of $400. It's the average. We say that it will be sunset as well if the average arrearage in electric bill equals $175. And the, net, the fourth bill, if natural gas arrearages accounts uh, equal at least one in four households around the country. And the last one, we sunset it if percentage of overdue accounts in the electric industry hits 25 percent. In parts of Michigan, we're one in three. Probably four to five hundred million dollars in lost money going to my utilities in Michigan because of high accounts. If this legislation increases the personal uh, consumers' accounts in, in gas and electricity by a magnitude of what we've already seen in Michigan, we say stop. Consumers, you're going to be protected, and we're going to come back and help you by sunsetting this uh, legislation and come back uh, and go through a markup to make this bill a little bit more responsible, and I, I yield back my time. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Markey is recognized. Thank the, I thank the gentleman. Uh, there are eight separate component parts uh, to this on block amendment, so I will try to, in this brief period of time, reflect upon uh, a few of them. First. Uh, the five-year sunset, essentially, on the bill. Uh, in terms of creating a marketplace for predictable investment 
uh, in the technologies that are going to be necessary in order to uh, move us to this clean uh, energy jobs future. Uh, it will basically discourage uh, a very large percentage of what we believe to be uh, a trillion dollar marketplace ready to go once they know what that marketplace is going to look like. And so just from the very beginning, saying that the whole program sunsets in five years ensures that the investment will not be there. Second, in terms of the allocation um, uh, with regard to uh, the utility sector, um, we work with the Edison Electric Institute uh, in developing this formula. Uh, this is a formula that was accepted across the full span of the Edison Electric uh, Institute. Uh, it's something that was embraced by them and actually serves as a foundation to uh, the legislation. Perhaps it could have been tweaked here or there, but you could not, in fact, uh, achieve a, a consensus in an organization that broad uh, unless those internal deliberations uh, led to uh, a certain regional fairness in terms of the way in which that program was constructed. Thirdly, in terms of international offsets, as, as we all know, 20 percent of all greenhouse gases are emitted uh, from because of deforestation. Uh, pr the preservation of the rainforests of our planet uh, are without question one of the most cost-effective way uh, in which uh, compliance with this bill can be achieved. Uh, to remove international offsets from uh, this legislation uh, would be to, one, uh, make it more expensive uh, for all of the uh, entities covered by the legislation to comply. And secondly, uh, we would not be investing uh, in that area where we could have uh, derived the greatest reductions in greenhouse gases. So the totality of the amendments that uh, uh, that are all bundled here in this, um, uh, in this one proposal uh, reflect, again, a, a skepticism of the legislation, and that is the right of the minority. But uh, at the same time, we believe that in its totality uh, that the, the, the provisions which we have dealing with consumer rates, working through the Edison Electric Institute, looking at the trade exposed energy intensive industries, looking through the steel industry, the cement industry, the paper, the aluminum and other trade exposed industries in terms of the allocation formulas, looking at the natural gas, the oil heating sector, putting together these formulas all intended to create a pathway uh, that makes it possible for industries to make the transition with consumers to this new clean job creation uh, future uh, that backs out uh, the uh, imported oil while at the same time reducing greenhouse gases. So uh, I, I hope that Would the, the gentleman on yield. our side reject these amendments Would and the gentleman yield. yield to the chairman, if he would like, for uh, a comment. But uh, beyond that, uh, I just urge a, a no vote and well, I yield back the balance of my time. The uh, gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Barton, seek Chairman, I withdraw my reservation. The reservation uh, for a point of order is withdrawn. Uh, Mr. Barton? Two minutes. I yield to you two minutes, and you may I yield, yield to others. Mr. Boyer, but let me say first, on the international offset program, that is a disaster waiting to happen because the U.N. and the European Union have been trying to find a way to get compliance with their international offsets. And, and they have admitted in, that it's, it is almost impossible to do. Again, we're not opposed to an offset program if you're going to have uh, a cap and trade program with allowances, but those offsets ought to be domestic, not international. And there is some, again, implicit acknowledgement of the problems internationally because it requires either 1.25 or 1.5 tons of international offsets to get a one ton credit in the United States. On the 100 percent allocation that Mr. Boyer put in play, that is a huge issue and is something we're going to discuss hopefully at length in the hearing that the chairman has promised to have. You really do create a regional disparity. If you're in a region where all of your electricity is generated uh, by coal or natural gas, uh, you get a 50 percent allowance. So you're going to have to buy 50 percent. On the other hand, you're in a region where the electricity is generated primarily by hydro or wind power or nuclear power. You get your 50 percent for your 
um, <clears throat> for your emissions, and then you get 50 percent for your uh, retail sales, if I understand it. That is an absolute windfall. And what that means in the real world is money is going to go from the south and the midwest uh, to the northwest uh, and to those areas that have a heavy component of, of nuclear power. It, it's an unfair windfall. Now, the fact that EEI supports it uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing to do. And I, I would guarantee you that if this bill becomes law, we will come back every year and tweak that, trying to rebalance that balance. I want to yield negative 13 seconds to Mr. <laughs> Boyer. Mr. Chairman, may I ask you to ask consent for 30 seconds? The gentleman uh, will be given one minute, and he doesn't have to take it all. I, I thank the chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to agree with you. I believe every member here in this committee, we want what's best for our country. And uh, I look at, as I look at the map of the country, I recognize, as Mr. Shimkus had brought out, that there are regions of the country that have a higher standard of living and they are going to have their utility bills drop under the present schematic in the bill. And so the numbers that I shared with the committee, I think, tell the story very well on how I believe that the 50-50 formula is unfair. But that's the dimension which I see the world because I come from a state that's 96 percent dependent. But, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to compliment you. I want to compliment you on, on the arc of fair dealing and wise tolerance in which you have handled the gavel through a very difficult mark. And I extend my personal compliments uh, to you for having done that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. The vote now, despite those kind words, I'm not going to vote for your amendment. <laughs> the vote now comes on the Boyer Amendment and Block. And as much as I like Mr. Boyer, uh, never mind, I should make, uh, I'm chairman. The vote now comes on Mr. Boyer's Amendment and Block. All those in favor of the, uh, the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. 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 Chairman, I ask for a roll call. Okay, let's go for a roll call. <laughs> Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey votes no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher, no. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, no. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush, no. Ms. Eshoo. No. Ms. Eshoo, no. Mr. Stupak. Mr. Stupak votes no. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, no. Mr. Green. No. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Gett. Mr. Gett votes no. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, no. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Harmon. Mr. Harmon, Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Schakowsky. Ms. Schakowsky votes no. Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner. Where are you? No. <laughs> Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner votes no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, no. Mr. Barrow. I'm sorry, Mr. Melanson. Where is he? Vote. Mr. Melanson votes no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, no. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Mrs. 
Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy votes no. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Oh, Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Stearns. Mr. Stearns votes aye. Mr. Deal. Mr. Mr. Whitfield. Aye. Mr. Whitfield, aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus, aye. Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt votes aye. Mr. Boyer. Aye. Mr. Boyer, aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Radon Mr. Radonovich votes aye. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bono Mack. Ms. Bono Mack, no. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, no. Mr. Terry. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers votes aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick votes aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn votes aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry, aye. Mr. So Scalise. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. Inslee. Is Mr. Inslee? Where? Oh. Mr. Inslee. No. Mr. Inslee votes no. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Okay. Chair seen, sees no other members seeking recognition. The clerk. Not the vote. Not the vote. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Clerk will announce the vote. Okay. Mr. Chairman, th on that amendment, there were 20 ayes and, I'm sorry, there are 20 ayes and 38 noes. 20 ayes and 38 noes, and the amendment's not agreed to. Ms. Sutton? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I know it's uh, late, so I'll be very brief. Um, throughout the course of uh, working on this bill, I know that, uh, that the chairman have been engaged with many of us uh, dealing with some of the concerns we have over the provisions related to biomass, and I would just uh, uh, ask that uh, perhaps for a, a commitment to continue our work to see if we can't address those concerns as the bill moves forward. I, I, I think the gen Yes, Woody Biomass is what I said, Mr. Ball. Yeah, baby. That's right. <laughs> I, 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 I want to give you my commitment as I've, uh, I, because I think this is an important issue and we have to continue to work on it and see if we can find a, a good accommodation for those who have such great concerns I about it. Thank and, you. And I would add my commitment uh, as well. I don't think we've begun to learn as much as we are going to learn about biomass, and we are going to create <laughs> yeah, an baby. environment in which that is possible, and we're going to work with the, with the gentlelady and other members towards that goal. I thank you. The uh, question is on the... for everyone. The, the question is on the Waxman-Markey amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended. This is not final passage but to adopt the uh, 
amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose no. no. The ayes have it. Before we get to the final vote on this bill, I'd like to recognize myself very briefly. Um, I want to thank all members for their work on this legislation. This has been a, a process, a difficult one for this week, but it's involved many months of work, in fact, many years of work, and I particularly want to thank Chairman Emeritus John Dingle, uh, Chairman Markey, Mr. Boucher, Mr. Doyle, Mr. Inslee, Mr. Green, Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Butterfield, Mr. Rush, and Ms. Sutton for all their work as we crafted uh, key provisions of this bill. And I, I want to also add Mr. Space because his amendment, I don't know if it was yesterday or today, but it was a very uh, important amendment and I want to express my appreciation to him. And I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Joe Barton for working with me through this process and the consideration of this legislation. Uh, he's a great gentleman and a guide, and I appreciate that. To uh, all the members, uh, I, I express my uh, admiration for all of you for the work that you've done and being concerned about these issues, even though we have differences of opinion, willing to debate them. We're taking a decisive and historic action to promote America's energy security, to create millions of clean energy jobs that will drive our economic recovery and long-term growth. We, when this bill is enacted into law, we'll break our dependence on foreign oil, make our nation the world leader in clean energy jobs and technology, and cut global warming pollution. Uh, for those who are interested in trivial pursuit, we've now had uh, four uh, very long days of debate lasting approximately 37 hours. On Monday, we had statements from 30 members of the committee. We received over 350 potential amendments at the desk, including over 280 from our Republican colleagues. Uh, from Tuesday through today, we considered 94 amendments, 38 from Democrats, 56 from Republicans. We passed or accepted many of these amendments, and I believe uh, the amendments uh, have improved the bill, and the, both those that, that have been adopted and those that we raised uh, various points uh, for us to think about. Uh, as uh, our, a result of our work, our bill today and the process we're following have gained substantial support from industry, labor, and environmental groups throughout the country. Over 60 major organizations, associations, companies, unions, environmental, and community groups have expressed support for the step we're about to take in reporting this bill from committee. From Duke Energy and EEI to the Environmental Defense Fund and the Natural Resources Defense Council and Sierra Club, from GE and Alcoa and DuPont, the mine workers, the auto workers, the steel workers, from Shell and Conoco to the World Wildlife Fund, there's a growing consensus on the need to act and act responsibly, and I believe that's what we have done. But this is not the end of our work. I've committed to the members and to the ranking member that will hold further hearings on the allocation portions of the bill. Other committees will consider the bill and then we'll move to the floor. But every member of this committee should be proud of our work this week and over the past few years on this important issue. And I thank you all for the, the, the diligence in which we've, each member has applied himself or herself to the matter before us. This is an important bill, maybe one of the most important bills that we will consider in this Congress. And I want to yield time to Mr. Barton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for those kind words you said about me. But don't let it happen again. <laughs> um, I have already been Twittered that my reelect has fallen five points because of what you just said. <laughs> so, but seriously, I, I do want to commend you and and uh, your members, especially Mr. Markey, your subcommittee chairman, for uh, the way you've conducted the debate. Um, I can, as I said earlier, I don't agree with the work product, but I do agree and am very much impressed with um, uh, your ability uh, in your first major test as chairman to, to uh, uh, keep the committee functioning in a uh, collegial way, which is no trivial accomplishment. 
Um, it, it really is impressive. Um, I want to thank the staffs on both sides, both at the committee level and the uh, personal level. Encourage them to want raises. Yeah, they have done an outstanding job. Um, at the appropriate time, I will offer an amendment to the bill. We now have a new source of biomass, and that's all the amendments that we've placed at the desk. <laughs> a small forest somewhere in uh, Greg Walden's district has been destroyed. <laughs> it, it, it will not count, however, <laughs> as a renewable. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, on the substance of the bill, I, I know that those of you that are proponents have every right to be proud of it, and to the victors go the spoils. So, I, I am not going to speak at length on what I see as the shortcomings. Suffice it to say that myself and others that will not vote for the bill do have legitimate and serious concerns about the redirection of our energy policy. Uh, in America, which the foundation and the bedrock of our free market economy, which is the most efficient, the most productive, the largest in the world, one third of the world's GDP is based on the United States economy. And that economy, for over 150 years, has been based on a free market allocation of resources in the energy sector. And this bill does make fundamental changes in that basic philosophy. Now, those of you that support the bill uh, have every right to think that, that, that those changes are necessary. And, and for the sake of, of our nation, uh, I, I, I hope to some degree that you're right. I'm afraid that you're not. But we will see. In any event, Mr. Chairman, I do commend you. Uh, I also want to commend the members on my side of the aisle. It's easy on the majority to keep up a good faith attitude and it, because you're winning. Now, you mentioned that there were 56 Republican vote uh, amendments offered. I think two or three of those were accepted. Uh, it is not a lot of fun as you well know, having been in the minority yourself for 12 years, uh, to work very hard and put just as much effort and just as much focus and get beat time after time after time after time, 36 to 22, 31 to 20, whatever it is. Not every amendment on the Republican side that was not accepted was a gotcha amendment. Uh, and some of those, in fact, I would say many of them have merit. And at some point in time, uh, I do hope we can work in a bipartisan basis on some of these issues. So anyway, Mr. Chairman, you and Mr. Markey have every right to be proud of what you've accomplished. Those of us on the minority side commend you for your effort, look forward to working with you. And one last thing, I do want to commend in addition to all the members on the re Republican side, special commendation to my subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Upton, who has been an absolute soldier. Thank you, that, thank you Mr. Barton. I want to yield to Mr. Upton at this th point thank to you. make I, a few comments. I do have a few comments, and I, I appreciate uh, the way that the markup was run. We alternated amendments uh, back and forth. and. Uh, as the chairman said, this is one of the most important bills that many of us will ever mark up in this uh, committee. It was important that we went regular order. We could debate the amendments uh, with a decent amount of time um, these last number of days. There was a report that came out today that emissions fell last year. Uh, but they fell not because of legislation, but they, they fell because of a weakened economy, something that all of us bear. We're not happy with the unemployment numbers. We're not happy with the trade numbers. 
We're not happy with uh, the way that the uh, economy of this country has uh, been heading over the last number of months. And for Michigan, it's been a good, bad, it's been a long, bad spell. But we expect that with this legislation, should it become enacted, emissions will continue to fall, but it also could fall because of the a worsening economy that this bill may bring about. And that fear on our side is genuine. And that's why we worked so hard on amendments to try and offset those uh, economic woes. So I would say to the gentleman, to, to the chairman of the Democratic side, and all to the staff, thank you for allowing us uh, to be able to have our say uh, these last number of days. Uh, by committee rules, uh, you allowed us to offer amendments uh, that, that went back and forth, and we had uh, good engagement, and, and I think sets the stage for when this bill does get to the House floor. And I would hope that you as chairman and my friend, my good friend, Mr. Markey, and we've had a lot of battles that we've uh, been on the same side on over the last year, at tele, uh, over the last number of years at telecommunications and, and now again at energy. I would just hope that when this bill does wind its way to the floor, that you would urge the rules committee to be as accommodating as we've been the last, as you've been the last couple of days. That we be able to offer amendments, uh, whether they be bipartisan or partisan on the House floor, because we know, at least on this side, that there are a good number of improvements that we can see to the, this bill that will indeed reduce emissions without harming our economy. And whether they be with nuclear, whether they be with renewable, whether they be with issues that we've learned a lot about from the Northwest with uh, woody biomass and, and all of that, uh, we know that we can improve this piece of legislation. We look forward to engaging in a positive way uh, down the road. And again, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Upton. Mr. Markey, thank you, Mr. to Chairman. close the debate and discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. First, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, masterful way in which you uh, and uh, your staff uh, conducted uh, this uh, proceeding. Uh, I want to thank um, all of the staffs. There's a litany of saints too long to enumerate who worked very hard to produce this a product and they each deserve credit. I want to thank all of the members, the Democrats who have been participating uh, in the construction of this legislation, but also the Republicans uh, who have played uh, a very important role uh, in good spirit and seriousness uh, in uh, this uh, debate uh, in trying to improve it. Uh, and we thank you for that. I thank my uh, good friend, uh, Joe Barton and uh, Fred Upton for the way in which uh, they led the minority throughout this debate. Uh, it is a very difficult process. This is my 33rd year uh, on this committee and I know what it feels like to be in the minority on big energy issues when they're being debated in this committee. And I very much appreciate the way uh, in which uh, you have uh, comported yourselves and, uh, and the minority has as well. Uh, I am proud of the way in which this uh, committee has conducted itself. It is, it is in the finest traditions uh, of the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, going back through John Dingle uh, and you, Joe Barton, uh, and continued here uh, by Henry Waxman. Uh, and I think uh, that is why this committee is held in such esteem. Uh, the vote which we are about to cast in my opinion is one that will, will be remembered decades from now. Uh, and, uh, and I know that um, each member who has participated in this uh, debate knows that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I thank everyone for their hard work in making uh, this moment possible. So again, Mr. Chairman, I want to congratulate you on the tremendous way in which you have comported yourself. And I move to report favorably H.R. 2454 as amended to the House floor. First of all, let me ask unanimous consent to make technical and conforming changes, and without objection, that will be the order. The motion before us is to report uh, H.R. 2454 as amended, favorably as amended. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle votes aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, aye. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Boucher, 
Aye. Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, aye. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes aye. Mr. Rush. Aye. Mr. Rush, aye. Ms. Eshoo. Aye. Ms. Eshoo, aye. Mr. Stupak. Yes. Mr. Stupak, aye. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel, aye. Mr. Green. Yes. Mr. Green, aye. Ms. Gett. Mr. Gett votes aye. Mrs. Caps. Mrs. Caps, aye. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle, aye. Ms. Harmon. Ms. Harmon, aye. Ms. Schakowsky. Aye. Ms. Schakowsky votes aye. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Gonzalez votes aye. Mr. Inslee. Aye. Mr. Inslee, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, no. Mr. Weiner. Mr. Weiner, aye. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, no. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield, aye. Mr. Melison. Mr. Melison, no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow, no. Mr. Hill. Aye. Mr. Hill, aye. Ms. Matsui. Aye. Ms. Matsui, aye. Mrs. Christensen. Aye. Mrs. Christensen, aye. Ms. Castor. Aye. Ms. Castor, aye. Mr. Sarbanes. Aye. Mr. Sarbanes, aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Aye. Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Space. Aye. Mr. Space, aye. Mr. McNerney. Aye. Mr. McNerney, aye. Ms. Sutton. Aye. Ms. Sutton, aye. Mr. Braley. Yes. Ms. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch. Aye. Mr. Welch, aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes <coughs> no. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall, no. Mr. Upton. No. Mr. Upton, no. Mr. Stearns. No. Mr. Stearns votes no. Mr. Deal. <coughs> Mr. Whitfield. No. Mr. Whitfield, no. Mr. Shimkus. No. Mr. Shimkus, no. Mr. Shattuck. No. Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Blunt. No. Mr. Blunt votes no. Mr. Boyer. No. Mr. Boyer, no. Mr. Radonovich. No. Mr. Radonovich votes no. Mr. Pitts. No. Mr. Pitts, no. Ms. Bono Mac. Aye. Ms. Bono Mac, aye. Mr. Walden. No. Mr. Walden votes no. Mr. Terry. No. Mr. Terry, no. <coughs> Mr. Rogers. No. Mr. Rogers, no. Mrs. Myrick. No. Mrs. Myrick votes no. Mr. Sullivan. No. Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess votes no. Ms. Blackburn. No. Ms. Blackburn, no. Mr. Gingry. No. Mr. Gingry, no. Mr. Scalise. No. Mr. Scalise votes no. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Seeing no other member asking for recognition, the clerk will tally the vote. Clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on the vote on final passage, there were 30, 33 ayes and 25 noes. 33 ayes, 25 noes. The motion is agreed to.
Thank you very much. is now adjourned. So ends day four of this markup. The House Energy and Commerce Committee has wrapped up work now on energy and climate change legislation. The committee voted to approve a cap and trade system to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Henry Waxman, the chairman of the committee, has said he'll hold at least one day of hearings on the bill after the Memorial Day recess. President of